Today's feast of the Trinity has an unusual twist to it, in a sense. It, it celebrates God. Well, of course, every feast is somehow about God, and every Eucharistic celebration is certainly about God. But it's usually about what God has done, from the acts of creation all the way through salvation history that's recorded in the Old Covenant books of Scripture and into the New Covenant time, including what God has done through Jesus Christ. And on beyond that, through all of the men and women who are the disciples of Jesus Christ, including us. So this is a feast about God being God. And we can thank the 12th century scholastics for talking and writing about God from a sort of cerebral, a sort of academic perspective. And they wrote volumes of stuff. Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure and those folks. And there have been hundreds, thousands of volumes written about God since then. And I suggest that relative to the number of people who believe in God, very few have probably read all of these books about God. Even fewer have understood them, and only two or three actually enjoyed them. <laughs> and although it's important for us to know about God, whether in scholarly writings or through the creeds that we profess, those concise statements about God, I believe in God, etc. Our faith is really more about what we do because we know about God. The names of God are important, but kind of really secondary in a sense. And the one thing we know about God from the scriptures is that God desires us, God claims us, God redeems us. In other words, God first believes in us, and then God does all manner of things for us. The most critical of those is that God sends us into the widest of worlds. As we heard in the Gospel, the movement of God is always outwards. Always outwards. The God of Scripture is a God who gets into people's lives. In popular language, we would say, God just never stops messing with us. God, look what happened to Moses and Abraham and Sarah. Look what happened to Jeremiah. He didn't want to have anything to do with God's ideas. Or Jonah. Look what happened to Ruth and to Mary and to Joseph and to Jesus and to the disciples. So this is not a God of definition, but a God so, so intimate that God gets inside who we are and what we do and what we should be doing. So the Trinity is not so much about who God is or about arguing how to name God. It's about how God is about a God whose mysterious presence is in each of us and yet can't be contained by all of us. And so we do well to ask, how is God? That is, how is God?
present. How is God is a question of engagement. And so when we say to people, how are you? How are you today? How are you doing? Do we want to learn something? Or do we want to connect with the other? Do we want information? Or do we want engagement? How is God? Paul, in his letter today, sees God as the Abba, as Father. For others, God is Mother, like for Sarah, and for Israel. For others, God is the Friend, as God comes to us in Jesus. For others, God is like all my brothers and sisters. No exceptions. If you want to know God, I need them to know how are you. For God is in the faces, in the struggles, and in the joys of all of God's people. So the mystery of the Trinity is more than... Uh, a formula, a prayer formula, as beloved and as familiar as that is. It's a model of how we live with each other. For each of us contributes to the well-being of the other. The mystery of the Trinity is how a community of hospitality is shaped and lived and moved outward. This is the liturgy of life. What we have professed in faith and prayed in common, we live in the grace and the life of this Trinitarian God. So if we could touch all of the faces that together paint the mosaic of how God is, we still would know all about God. But I would know that there is a presence of God in all of those lives and all of those faces and all of those dreams. I would know that much. And that might be enough. That might be enough.